How's it going guys, my name is Graham, and welcome to Two Life Thumbs. In the last few years, I have done reviews of both Jackbox 4 and 5, and now just recently we had the release of Jackbox 6. For anyone who's unfamiliar, the Jackbox Party Pack is a yearly supply of five party games that you can play on PCs, consoles, and numerous other mediums and screens, and then every player in the room is connecting to that online and playing with their phone, which means you don't have to worry so much about having four or ten controllers, you just use the phones that everyone already has. I've now had a chance to play the various different games a few times, sit on it, enjoy it, form my thoughts, I've even put out videos of us playing each of the individual games from the pack if you guys want to check those out themselves. Here I'll provide quick summaries of the five different games in this year's pack, as well as my general thoughts on those experiences. First up, the quick and easiest one to talk about would be Trivia Murder Party 2. It's a return of one of our all-time favorite individual games in any pack, making a comeback from Jackbox 3. The setting, the narrator, the humor, everything else that play into it are all as enjoyable as they were before. Playing off the slasher movie tropes and specific roles that fall within, those ideas of reboots and sequels, it's all still very clever. I really enjoy the hotel setting, it's full of references and homages that are a nice touch. The gameplay is more or less the same as you've seen before. It's a trivia game, but with new questions obviously, and the main hook still being that the players that get the trivia wrong are forced to go to a killing floor. Winners get points, and either the losers or everyone participates in minigames to see whether or not those losers stay alive. There's a ton of variety in the minigames, it's crazy fun, it's, it's as good as it was before. You play it until either every player except one is dead, or you reach the 10th floor. Living players have an advantage and start out in the lead, the ghosts are then ranked based on how many points they came to that round with, you're trying to answer questions to make your way across this little room, but dead players are given one additional prompt to help them catch up. If they do ever overtake the living player, then they themselves become a living player and are then reduced back to two prompts. One little change that exists this year is that there is a barrier at the end that stops someone from having a total blowout. Once you reach this barrier, the only way to cross it is to get 100% of your prompts correct. It's a nice little catch-up mechanic, I'm not sure if it really needs to be there, I would appreciate the ability to turn it off maybe, but it changes things up a bit. All new minigames, all new jokes from the narrator, it's, it's great to come back to this. If you enjoyed the first one, you're gonna love this one. It's more of the same, and in some ways better. The minigames are, are just great. It's a fantastic experience. Not much to be said there. Next up, let's talk about Joke Boat. First off, I just love the setting of this one. Playing as a group of terrible comedians on a disaster-prone cruise is pretty damn funny in and of itself. That being said, in some ways the setting is funnier than the actual game. At first you're asked to submit as many topics as possible, you gain prompts like submit an object, a name, location, plural noun, etc. You can submit as many of these as you want in the time given. During the next part, each player is then given a joke setup, basically a short little Mad Lib. You're then given a list of some of the random topics that had been submitted previously, you choose one of those to insert, and you have to craft the punchline entirely yourself. If a topic you submitted is used during anyone's jokes, you get points for it. Now, I wouldn't mind the concept of this game very much, but there's not really that many unique setups in the game, and the fill-in-the-blank style doesn't leave a ton of room for creativity, it's not nearly as open-ended as Quiplash, and the structure of jokes doesn't really offer the same ability to play around with this style of punchline crafting the way last year's Madverse City did. I kind of see what they were going for here, but it honestly just worked way better in that game. For example, there was a how many blanks does it take to screw in a light bulb? Depending on your topic, you're probably pretty limited to begin with. But then for some unnecessary reason, the game also included one to change it and two to blank. I don't understand why the game felt the need to include that and force your hand in the punchline. It's a very rigid structure to work with. It robs you of the option to subvert the setup or potentially use numbers that actually made sense with your topic. Maybe one and two isn't always logical. It's weird to think of logic with humor, but janky setups like this really did kill people's jokes. It was incredibly tough to be funny. I mean, it is in any game, but it really felt that way in this one. As such, we often delivered our jokes with no real confidence, because we realized they were stupid as soon as it was time to say them. We probably laughed more at the attempts than the actual jokes themselves, and that kind of gets old quickly. We were fine kind of razzing each other over that, but maybe some people would take it personally. The funniest part is in the next round, you actually get the opportunity to rewrite someone else's joke. So you may have spent the last round thinking they were unfunny and judging them relentlessly, but now you kind of have to put your funny where your mouth is. Can you actually do better? If you rewrite a previously failed joke, you only get a thousand points. It's, it's worth less. If you rewrite a joke that had done well in the previous round and you win out over it, it's worth 2,000 points. So there's a little bit of a risk reward there. I'm being 
critical because the flaws kind of stand out in this one, but we felt compelled to give it a few tries and still enjoyed it somewhat each time. But the moments of genuine gold were much more sparse than Madverse City or Quiplash. Most of the laughs came from the weak attempts rather than the ones that were actually funny, and I don't see us collectively having the urge to play this one together as often because of it. It's not a bad game, but you might need to play with actual comedians to stand a chance with some of those setups. Role Models is a super unique concept for Jackbox. I don't think we've seen a game like it before. At the beginning, you choose these broad categories, and they have a specific number of role assignments that match the number of players within. You then slot your friends into various roles you think fit them best. Not unlike those old Facebook posts where people would assemble their friend team for, like, the, you know, the zombie apocalypse or something like that. Which My Little Pony character would you be? I don't know. Here, points are earned by falling in with the majority. If I assign player 1 to a position that the majority of other players agree that they should be in, I get a point. The player in question is also awarded a point when the group decisively agrees. When there's a split decision, additional questioning is used to get to the truth. The player who lands the role after this gets a big pile of points, while the other one is left with nothing. These splits are risky, but winning them will likely put you out in the lead. When you're making the choices in the original round, there's also the option to double down if you're 99% certain that you know where someone will land. You can earn bonus points that way. So really you're rewarded for both knowing your friends well and in turn being knowable to them. You play a couple rounds of this, there's additional steps that are taken if the scientists in the lab of this game are unable to properly assign someone a role. For example, after the results of the first two rounds, one person was seen as both a leader and sidekick. Those are in contradiction to one another, so the game made them do additional testing to see which of the two they truly were. Or perhaps two people in the group came out with two roles that give them similar personality types. The game would do another round of testing to sort that out. Overall, the game is simple, fun to deliberate on, and definitely worth some laughs, especially when one friend has to be stuck in a role, like the being the unsalted broth of the soup world. The finale of defining personality types for each person based on the weird responses is pretty hilarious and potentially accurate, you know, in like a horoscope sort of way. Honestly, we didn't really seem to care about winning here. It was much more about the process of assigning roles and having laughs and little disagreements and unanimous decisions about where someone should land. It was just a funny excuse to take a group survey and compare results. It, it was a nice change of pace. After beating yourself up for being horribly unfunny after something like Joke Boat, it was nice to kick back and laugh at the game and each other in a way that didn't really put the pressure on. Next up is Dictionarium, possibly the shortest Jackbox game ever made. Seriously, rounds of this took like 10 minutes. Players are given a fake word for which they have to provide a definition. It's not like Boulder Dash or Fibbage where you're trying to fool people, although I think that would have been a fun game mode. Instead, it's simply about being funny, but you kind of want to come up with something fairly reasonable since it's at its funniest when it actually seems believable. Once the favorite definitions have been chosen, players must then submit synonyms based on what was previously set up. This can be a fun challenge depending on how open to interpretation the definition was. And then finally, the players use that synonym in a sentence. Players then choose who has best represented the word given its definition. The game ends by showing a simple etymology of how it progressed and enters it into the Jackbox dictionary. Yeah, it's as simple as it sounds, it's a very short game. And honestly, after we had been playing for a few hours, we found it kind of perfect for that little itch at the end of the night where we all kind of went, maybe we fit in one more game? Being short definitely works in its favor. Dwelling on answers too long, stretching out the jokes too far would easily zap the fun. Instead, it felt fresh and breezy through each round, just edging on overstaying its welcome. It's not the most clever game, it's not the most exciting game, it's a reasonably creative game, but considering how short, low effort, and low commitment it was, we've still got some pretty serious laughs out of it. I ended up enjoying Dictionarium more than I thought. Finally, we have Push the Button. I intentionally saved talking about this one to the end, since it's likely the most complex game in the pack, and maybe of any Jackbox ever. It's a concept you've seen before but it's, it's done very, very well. Players are split into humans, and a couple of them are secret aliens. Aliens are trying to blend in, and humans try to catch them and jettison them off into space. Players take turns as the captain, and they choose from the selection of players to perform a series of tests to prove their humanity. All the humans in the room will be given the same prompt, whereas there will be a slight variance on what aliens receive, and they have to do their best to blend in and defend those answers. The different rooms of the spaceship result in different testing types. You might have to type out a response, you might have to choose between slightly agree, slightly disagree, and all that sort of stuff. You might even have to draw your response. Jackbox took the odd man out lying of their old game Fakin' It, and twisted in concepts from tabletop games like Werewolf or Mafia, maybe a few newer video games that also have space themes like Among Us or I Am Not a Monster, but 
those games are much more action based. This one is much more deliberate and only singles out a few people at a time. I think push the button works in pretty well every way that faking it struggled. I've had fun rounds of faking it in the past, but I found this to be the far superior game. The improvements just enhance the experience so much. There's a ticking clock hanging over you the whole time where the game always takes that set amount of time. Knowing this puts pressure on every decision to be efficient. But players also have the ability to rush segments. Once per test, every player can apply a rush, making it pass by much more quickly. If they feel like that segment or test is wasting time, it's not providing answers, then maybe they want to get through it and move on to the next thing. But the aliens might also try to rush the segments if they think that it's working against them and people are starting to figure them out. After several tests have been run, aliens are given the ability to hack other players. And this was where the game really blew open and became kind of incredible. It was already fun that not every player was in the spotlight at the same time, and if you're suspicious of someone, you can really drill them, and someone else who's good at lying can really fly under the radar. But with the hacks, aliens can alter a human's device to receive alien prompts, throwing suspicion on a player who would otherwise be off everyone's radar. The human is now left trying to defend the fact that their answer was different than everyone else's, but at the same time there might have been an alien in the test with them who's similarly claiming they were hacked. Potentially one, both, or neither of you are lying, it depends. Strategic hack using and saving is huge in this game. If you're an alien and chose to hang on to your hack, you could instead claim to everyone that someone else had used it against you. The mind games here are incredible and the resulting paranoia is hilarious. There's a limited use bioscanner device. The captain of that round drops two players in. If the captain is human, they drop two players in they feel they can trust. The captain is given a series of three symbols while the two players are looking at a variety of images on their screen. The captain has to try to dictate what the three symbols look like and the players have to try and find them on their screen. It's a difficult thing to do no matter what. If the two players are human, they'll do their best to complete the bioscanner because the captain can then choose one player on the ship and privately on their phone, the game will tell them if that one player is a human or alien. Now, this unpacks a lot of layers of complexity in this game all at once. The captain could have been human or alien and people might have just failed the test because their descriptions were bad. The captain could be human, accidentally drop in an alien or two and they intentionally sabotage things. The captain could be alien, drop in two humans, complete the test, and then lie about the private scanner result that they see on their phone. The captain could scan a human and claim they're an alien, or scan an alien and protect them by identifying them as human. There's just so many ins and outs to all of it. The game is frantic, strategic, tense, chaotic, frustrating, hilarious. This would be a fun game to buy and play all by itself. Now, if I had to complain about one thing, there were a few prompts that seemed particularly damning to the aliens. Look all the way back to Bidiots, for example. I think it did a much better job of providing drawing prompts that would yield similar results. When we played, it occasionally felt like the alien would have a super bright light shone in them when they were given a prompt that too obviously went in opposition to what the humans received. But at least in this game, they can retreat under a claim of having been hacked, so it balances out somewhat. As with the last few party packs, the Jackbox team has been leaning into streamer functionality. People can play together online, people can join in the audience and still participate, even if they're not one of the core players. There's certain options, like in the trivia games, you can make it so it doesn't ask quite so many USA specific questions. Wise decisions like that, that can enhance the experience for online play. But with games like role models that require players to know each other and wouldn't work at all with strangers, and push the button that's at its best when players can talk it out and defend or accuse one another, that only leaves the other three games truly viable for streaming, and with two of those three games, Dictionarium and Joke Boat, maybe being some of the weaker of the pack, still fine games, but ones that I think you're only going to play once or twice in an evening, I'd say this game is only worth it if you can play it in person with others you know. Guys, I've, I'm not funny. But now I know that all of you guys aren't funny as well, so we're all in the same boat. If that's the case, I think you'll have a blast. You guys will be playing for hours in a given evening and have tons of fun. But if I had to be honest, I expect most streamers are gonna stick to playing older packs more often than not. I would also say the absence of a drawing game is pretty noticeable. There's been at least one in every pack previously. Drawful, Bidiots, TKO, which, you know, some might rather forget, <laughs> Civic Doodle, and Patently Stupid. Drawful and Bidiots are among two of my favorite individual games. I'd honestly pay for like a Jackbox 6 expansion that added Bidiots 2 or, or some other fun drawing challenge. But who knows, maybe it's more worth their time to save that for for a future pack. Now overall I would say every box has its highs and lows, but in the past every pack has had at least one game that I've never played more than once or twice. 
this might be the first pack literally ever where we wanted to play each game a few times and enjoyed doing so every time. There are past examples like Civic Doodle that seemed to wear on and become less funny very, very quickly, but we were still enjoying this one after several hours. In that regard, it might be one of the all-time strongest packs. Push the Button might be one of the all-time best games. Trivia Murder Party is as incredible as it was before, still one of the top games. Role Models felt fresh and unique, maybe not one of the all-time best, but we really loved it. Dictionarium absolutely has its place, it's fast and fun for what it is, even if it is quite simple. And even though Joke Boat did go belly up a few times, we never hated our time with it. I can't say it's the best pack ever, but it's certainly high up. With each year, it's becoming harder and harder to slot these rankings. And I tend to shift my opinion over time, but right now, as I'm recording this, I think this might get the number two spot. I might have to reassess that in the future. That's how I'm feeling right now. Keep in mind, I have never really streamed these games. I tried to do it once, and it was fun for the people in the room, but the streaming was the least fun part of it for me personally, so I'm not really factoring that into my decision. It's whether or not I enjoy playing it on the couch with live friends in the room. If the streaming's what you're looking for, I imagine it would be much much lower on your list. Let me know what you guys think. I'd love to hear what you did and didn't like about this pack, where it stacks up against others for you, and if you're curious about seeing the different games in action, in the end cards here I will have a link to a playlist where we play each and every one at least once. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.